It is a pleasure being here. I just uh, drove over uh, early this morning from Champaign, and it's just quite beautiful entering this area with uh, the snow and the, the hills. You all have hills over here in Indiana. Somehow we miss our hill, missed any hills in Illinois. But it is a pleasure to be here, and it is a pleasure to talk about cyber infrastructure, and I'm going to give you my perspective of cyber infrastructure today and what it means culturally, primarily. Um, we're going to talk about data visualization, and I'll give you a sample of what our Renaissance team has done over the years. Um, but I started at the University of Illinois back in 1985 as an assistant professor in the School of Art and Design. And I immediately, uh, because I started in computer art, and, the, and in 1980s, or mid, early 80s, if you wanted to do something with a computer as an artist, you really had to program. So I started out actually developing software as an artist back in the 80s. Um, and by the time that I, and I started working with scientists as early as 1981, I was the first time that I, began to realize that through computer graphics, that art and science could come together, there, that there could be a convergence. And since the early 80s, that's what my passion has been. And I want to give you a few examples of some of the outcomes uh, over the years. Um, my group is called the Advanced Visualization Laboratory. Uh, we do interact, uh, interdisciplinary teamwork. Uh, with technologists, uh, computational scientists, educators, museum educators, producers, writers. And these are our formal um, titles. But uh, as you can see, we come from both sides of the disciplines, across the science and engineering to the arts and humanities, actually. And there's a very strong humanities component in our group. I was fortunate to be a part of uh, the, one of the first five NSF-funded supercomputing centers, and it was a transformative period. Uh, uh, computational science is the third pillar of science, and I probably proselytized it as much as any uh, computational scientist. We, it's a whole new method of doing science, and I have been an artist and have been privileged to work uh, using my design and visual literacy skills to take large volumes of data and translate it into new visual metaphors. Visualization is like the telescope, the virtual telescope into the digital laboratory of the future. And what I'm going to talk about today is how digital domes, uh, museums are playing as portals into the out of this, of this cyber infrastructure that's built around computational science, data visualization, and display devices. Numerical models permeate our world. Often people ask me, well, why should we care about computational science? And if you've ever gotten into a car, ridden in an airplane, uh, looked at uh, ec economy reports, there are financial models There are in the background run, being run, and they actually play a role in our everyday lives. And this has even become more critical in areas such as climate change or the prediction of where hurricanes will be going, because we need these advances in the mathematics and the algorithms in computers to be able to set up these large uh, systems of equations solve the physics and be able to predict phenomenon. And that phenomenon may go out hundreds of years, depending upon uh, pr predictions in terms of our water supplies or, or any, anything that we, where we cannot experience it in time and space. And we are trying to understand the future. Numerical models will and are playing an important role. So I've been able to observe how this transition from observing nature and scientists work together, and I've been out in the fields. I was born in Oklahoma. I know what a tornado is. 
And I've had a great experience in working with scientists who develop the physics in uh, a supercomputer, and, but it comes out in billions of numbers, uh, and I work with those billions of numbers to formulate them into visual metaphors. Now, as a digital probe into these numbers, there are tasks involved. Almost always there's too much data to visualize. Uh, there are, is a, a natural process of how humans relate to the visual language. We all have come to understand how to read a bar graph. Anybody can pick up a bar graph today in the USA Today and we understand that. It has become a part of our visual language. And today, with, this, with the techniques involved in data visualization, computational science, we are developing a new visual language. It's actually amazing. And we, as cyber infrastructure participants, are participating in our cultural future and our cultural heritage in the way that we are contributing to and participating in the evolution of our visual language. I coined the term visiphors in particular to talk about digital visual metaphors because there's a lot of visual metaphors out there that have nothing to do with computations or data. So visiphors is the term that I use to sort of capture the idea that you only start out with numbers and you have to abstract and understand and bring to the table what you already understand and know and understand the culture and the group and with, which, with whom you are working or trying to communicate with and understand where the hooks are in coming up with these vis visiphors. And because of the plethora of data and the data deluge today, these visual metaphors or visiphors are even more important. They're hooks. They're a part of our human computer interfaces. They're a part of our online uh, uh, social media. Uh, you can go and do, um, like with Touchpoint, and graph all of your social friends on Facebook right now. And these trees, these expanding images, are now we are starting to absorb. And even Facebook is teaching us how data visualization works. So I'm going to play for you uh, a very famous, some of you I'm sure have seen this, uh, visualization of a tornado. But I just want to preface this that when the scientists as a team, we were working side by side and there's this discovery period of taking the data and really trying to understand what is in the data. And we discovered uh, a, a secondary satellite tornado in this data. And another process that's not always familiar is often with these um, certain kinds of studies of computational science, there are thousands of ways you can set up these change decks to get an output. And once you set it up, it's a deterministic system. And if you get a tornado, that's actually a very small percentage of time. There's so many combinations of different components that once you actually see how the soundings from the Manchester tornado fed into the initial simulation, we got out a half a terabyte of numbers, and then we went through visualization as a discovery process and discovered a secondary tornado. And so I'm going to play this for you. This is the storm chaser perspective. It's been very exclusive. This.
recovering in the process of making this tornado. And they are still investigating, exploring, and milking that, that computational data set for why it actually evolved into two tornadoes. That, and at first, we were developing this uh, for um, a PBS Super Twister show. I mean, they had contacted me, and, I, and Intel was going to help fund it. And I said, well, that's terrific. And, but we found the second tornado in it, and, and the scientists said, well, we, we can't let you put that on television. We're not even sure it's right. And eventually, they, they talked to their colleagues who were out in the fields. These are a natural phenomenon that shows out in the real world. And eventually, they did let us uh, put it on television. But at first, they weren't sure. And the visualization became a way of debugging the numerical model. So you can take visiphors or visual idioms and apply it to other scientific domains. Here's the same visualization techniques, uh, trajectories colored by temperature, and there's a, a, a color table in the upper left, and the isosurfaces are showing a standard de deviation in the cold versus the warm water. Off the coast of Northern California, uh, Monterey, this is the Monterey Bay or Canyon that is underneath uh, uh, in the ocean off of Northern California and essentially apply the visual techniques to understanding ocean flow as well as air flow. So I just want to stop here and just say that what's really happening is that we're developing a new communication system with Visiforce and that this is very similar to what we did historically with geographical maps in unknown territories. The geographical maps were very useful. They were projections. They often had extra information that was either artistic or political or biased by the culture that is developing, that developed the maps. And that we have a Western Cartesian coordinate system that was developed during this period of time, and we still are taking data and transforming it into a Cartesian coordinate system today. And computer graphics and everything that you're going to see has been translated essentially into a three-dimensional spatial language that we have come to understand in two dimensions. And we will understand now through computer graphics in three dimensions. And I'm talking about spatial dimensions. I'm not talking about stereo eyeballs yet. So data visualization, this virtual fly-throughs, what we're doing uh, when we talk about caves and virtual environments or being online or talking to people through social media or flying through space or are looking at different ways of, of digital maps that we have today, a lot of the data we are only understanding through these cyber infrastructure processes. So another term that uh, I use is that this is our new digi digital epistemology. This is the digits, the computers, the cyber infrastructure, the techniques, the algorithms, the computational science is all a way that we know how we know. And we must, as human beings, continue to ask ourselves the questions, how do we know what we know digitally? And keep a check. That's why the scientific methodology is such a tremendous approach. Because then we have others. We can take a data set or the algorithms, put it out there. Other people can take that data set and visualize it themselves. But we should be in constant check against our own biases, and in fact, our own perspectives bias us. We can't get out of seeing data in other ways many times. We get locked into putting it in pie graphs and bar charts 
that sometimes our familiarity with the visualization process prevents us from being creative and innovative in taking that data and visualize it in, in new ways. And that's why the team approach is really important. It enables us to um, bring a fresh perspective to the problem. So I'm going to quickly go through uh, some of the projects that we've worked on in museums because I believe today that these large museums, such as the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and some of the others I'm going to point to, they're portals, they're cyber infrastructure portals and provide masses of people with an entire embodied experience because, um, let's see if I can use this, right, yay, uh, these digital domes that are coming up since year 2000, we've seen over 155 just in the United States, there's over hundreds that are being re-outfitted, the old planetaria are being outfitted with projection systems so people can sit inside and they look up and there's this hemisphere of almost anything now that it's digital. It doesn't have to be stars, although a lot of the, the people like to go and still see stars. Um, the Museum of, uh, of the, the Amer AMNH, the American Museum of Natural History is right there on Manhattan um, next to Central Park. And we collaborated right from Illinois over uh, a, a T2 line uh, years ago and developed some software uh, to collaborate and control their dome from our cave in Champaign just over the internet and designed an entire show, uh, two shows actually, Passport to the Universe that was narrated by Tom Hanks and Search for Life which was narrated uh, by um, Harrison Ford. And we never flew to New York the second time around. We were able to design a huge section of their movie and control the flights through the data from Illinois. And you have to be very careful. They would have an entire committee of people sitting in a room and making a judgment on uh, the, uh, you know, if it was too fast, too slow, where we should go. And you can actually make people sick if it's too fast in those environments. We've been working with Adler Planetarium and taking some of the materials that we developed for their digital dome shows, repurposing those visifors for their interactive space visualization laboratory. So the cyber infrastructure products of research, of the research experience, can be repurposed, reused, redesigned for educational experiences. We just finished a project with the California Academy of Science. This is the largest green public building. It's in San Francisco. And there's a biosphere dome under this section and a digital dome for their planetarium. And we just finished a show called Life, a Cosmic Story, in which we took data and integrated several computational simulations. This one is a turbulent cloud right here from Mike Norman and Alexei Kritsuk. And we positioned that in our Milky Way model, which we've been building and onto for uh, over 12 years now. Yeah, I'll leave the lights down because everything after this is pretty, pretty uh, dark. And so we had to integrate and embed this simulation inside of this model, which has other simulations embedded in it. Now we're flying into this cloud and heading toward a protoplanetary disk. And the protoplanetary disk simulation is by Aaron Boley from the University of Florida, and he's a Hubble fellow. And he has done this simulation where clumps of planets are beginning to form and the story of the, co it's part of the cosmic story which also goes into DNA but this is, this is part of the larger picture of how planets were formed around a star much like the sun, our own sun. And so this was a large uh, uh, 
integration of various simulations for a digital dome show. Now in Denver, we did black holes the other side of infinity. This was partially funded by the National Science Foundation and Denver Museum, and that was a, has been a tremendous success in digital dome shows. It's classified as one of the blockbusters, but it went through all of the training and testing. We collaborated with a global Renaissance team on that to have the educators, and they were testing uh, uh, students that were coming in. We did rough cuts, tested students, had focus groups, and then redid the entire show, uh, all with data-driven visualizations for the entire, uh, most of the show, over 30 terabytes of computational science for this ultra-high resolution. Here's how these digital domes work. There's 11 projectors here, and they're all having edge blending, and they come up with this, we come up with this dome master, and it gets projected onto various sizes. And we've learned how to reformat for any configuration of these domes. It's, uh, Black Holes has been distributed and translated into many languages as well. And people are really immersed in these hemispherical dome sounds with surround sound to give in, sometimes even rumbled seats to give you that feeling that you are there. Here's another simulation for just one of the shots of black holes. Just <clears throat> This was adaptive mesh refinement, which is a very difficult type of computational data to visualize. And what we have here is a first star that's going supernova. And we started out with lots of raw data, which had to be interpolated and yields a lot of images. So the visualization in some of these shows, the visualization itself becomes a supercomputing problem. But what are we really doing here? You know, that's just taking computational data and turning it using in computer graphics, turning it into visual that we can understand. Well, we're wayfinding our way and constructing a digital universe. Uh, we have to understand it. Well, a lot of this is interpretation. We basically are taking scientific models and checking them against a static, still, telescopic image uh, that NASA has gathered here, the Crab Nebula in this case. And we're double checking what we can grab as a snapshot in 2D with frequencies from a telescope against our computational methods in this digital laboratory. But it does take a lot of understanding. It's noisy data, whether it's observed or calculated. It's all noisy data, and there is this interpretation element to gain insight. And it's an iterative process. Now, one of the things that's pretty amazing about visual visiphors is that they can be repurposed and scaled for multiple audiences in various venues. So we could take part on uh, every shot that we developed for the Denver Museum, we could repurpose that data for the Monster of the Milky Way Nova show and, for example, show a uh, a jet coming out of a, a black hole. So, and in these proscenium environments, whether it, you're looking, uh, it, you know, it, it, through one of these digital domes, or in a second I'm going to show you the IMAX film, it's where uh, uh, Joseph Nesh Fatal says we're, we're evolving a kind of immersive intelligence. How, you know, just think, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't even have PowerPoint. Remember overhead, those overhead things, you know, those plastic things we used to have to use? Uh, but now we understand these flights faster than the speed of light. You know, we cannot in reality go this fast. I show these kinds of pictures and people say, did you fly a camera out there? 
no, you can't do that. But we are, we are starting to get this kind of visual language where people are understanding these experiences as their reality. In fact, some of these programs are, are advertised more than real. And again, the, pro, the, the, the outcome of our cyber infrastructure research can be used for these educational environments. And here's a, a few of, of the programs we've worked on, but this one, uh, uh, this one is coming out in um, May, and it was directed by Terrence Malick, but Terrence Malick, he says scientists are his rock stars. He is a director, uh, was in Hollywood for years, now it's in Austin, and uh, he has some uh, data-driven visualizations in the Tree of Life, which will be premiere in May, and it's got uh, Brad Pitt and Sean Penn are starring in that, and it looks pretty good. Like I said, visiphors are portable. They can be shown on stereo displays and domes. They can travel to places with other languages, and they can be interpreted. Visual language does not necessarily have attachment to it. To it. And sometimes I know we tur turn out these visuals and they take on a life of their own. And these portable domes, this just was over at uh, Champaign Library, There's where kids can get inside and crawl into them. So the visiphors are quite portable. And then uh, the uh, museum, and then also they can be turned into interactive displays. For example, the tornado is now at a kiosk in the Museum of Science and Industry as an interactive kind of experience in terms of controlling the colors and the uh, trajectories. And of course, there's print media. And there's outreach that's now being distributed over the web through NASA. So you can take the same visuals that we worked on for the California Academy of Science Museum and reformat them for other kinds of displays. So now, Hubble. And this is uh, a, uh, this, uh, all I can say is, and look how they, uh, market this, okay, Leonardo DiCaprio, this is their image, I am limited by Warner Brothers and how much I can show and what I can show. But look at this, change your view of our universe, black holes, it was better than real. I mean, this is how these kinds of shows, they're, they're digital, but now they have real computational science in them. And uh, the director, Tony Myers, came to Champaign and used our, our setup there. She's from IMAX. She's done Destiny in Space and Blue Planet. She's done all the large space shows. Most of the show, out of the 40 uh, minutes, most of the show is about the astronauts, and they've gone up into space to repair the Hubble telescope. And so it is fantastic if you get a chance to see it, especially in 3D. They're showing it in domes that don't, aren't outfitted for 3D. And here in the movie industry, when they say 3D, what they mean is stereo. That means you put on glasses, and for one eye, you're getting one image, and the glasses occlude that projection in one eye, and then you get a different image in the other eye. So the movie industry have, has co-opted 3D to mean stereo, to uh, binocular. And um, we use it in computer graphics. 3D means a three-dimensional spatial domain. So we're still using this wayfinding, the cyber infrastructure, in terms of how we are going to develop what good is repairing Hubble telescope. Why? We answer the question with virtual tours, and by taking Hubble data, we worked with the Space Telescope Science Institute and um, NASA to take Hubble data and to turn it into a spatial experience and a, t a stereo experience to show, to take us where we have not gone before, 
and to communicate the best science that we have today, both computationally with, with computational science, as you will see, and through telescopes. But our first task was to take the Orion Nebula, one of the most popular, Orion has been the most popular constellation in the history of humanity, and to work with the Space Telescope. First, they had to get rid of these foreground stars, like this one. So, so there's a lot of star removal. Space Cat Telescope did that. And then there are other objects that are sitting on top that we need, in terms of the computer graphics, to turn them into to render them separately as a three-dimensional experience. And one of them is the veil, which sits on top of the Orion Nebula. Then we have to do the anatomy of the Orion. We had to understand where the valleys were, and the scientists had to analyze these depressions and through the frequency data, not through the visual data, but through frequencies. There's optical, there's uh, a lot of information that comes back from these telescopes, and this is the best science that we have today, although as our telescopes improve, our science will improve. But we knew that there was this plateau up here in this dark bar, and in the trapezium, the famous stars, and these stars around here are all, especially down here, are being born inside the nebula. The nebula is like a star nursery where stars are being born. So we worked with the Space Telescope to actually create the geometry and depression and get it into three-dimensional computer graphics for rendering. So we first have to make the models, and then we have to carefully, and this is not an automatic process, you have to take the high-resolution texture maps and put it back on these models, but they get torn, they get, there's a lot of fixing that has to be done, an iterative process with the space telescope. And then there's the other components like the veil that has to have their own geometry. So here's the dark bar that we have often called, as we worked on it many, many times, the finger of God, and then we would, uh, work and have to get all the geometry from space telescope and locate it correctly inside the trapezium with the stars and the bow shocks, which are wind that's being blown. These are astronomical objects that they can partially observe and they understand with the uh, help of the telescope, but a lot of it is interpretation at this point. So the final dynamic range layers we had to compute for each eyeball, 5,616 pixels wide for each stereo pair. That means times two uh, DPX, and then we had to take it to film. And each of these shots had to be put on film and tested and wedges done to make sure that we get the correct uh, lighting on everything. So here's the base model that you can see now we've translated into a three-dimensional environment. This has the, the uh, texture on it, but see how these edges look hard? This does not look like a nebula. So part of it is giving the audience there is an expectation a nebula looks nebulous, right? It looks cloudy. It's, it actually, if we could fly up there and see it, it would be like fog. So we developed a new renderer to take this data and to render it volumetrically so that it would give the appearance of the dark bar, but this is all very see-through and nebulous, as a nebula should be. And here we are with the model, three-dimensional spatial model and the texture, hand sewn on, believe me, and then how it looks after it's rendered with the stars added in. And the propylids, that's these little things that look like tadpoles, where these are like uh, inside where tiny, tiny, they look tiny to us, but they're protoplanetary disks that are forming uh, stars and in some cases planets. Again, the base model with texture and the render 
and how it changes the look and appearance. And then the other astronomical objects, this is a propylid with an a protoplanetary um, disk forming uh, planets inside. And then it, this all has to be embedded in the three-dimensional model of the Milky Way. Now here's the data we really get back from Hubble. That's what the protoplanetary disk looks like. So this has to, we had to work with the scientists to interpret and understand. And Robert Hurt, Dr. Robert Hurt from the Spitzer Institute did this simulation of this protoplanetary disk with a star inside forming planets. And we had to layer it in and put it inside the Orion Nebula. So let me just show you before I run out of time and then we'll, we'll take you and play the, the pieces back. The layers, these are all the different layers for compositing in Z depth, in, a, in Z, on a spatial domain. And we had to do all of that work, and I'm just describing Orion, but we had Horsehead and these other nebulas, and this all had to be placed inside the Milky Way with its, the accurate location with star catalogs and constellations. And then we had to choreograph it. So just getting it modeled and then the renderer going, then you have to actually make the moves like with virtual director through the space. And that's when the director came to Champagne and sat down and we, in real time with a, a space ball, did these flights and tested and tested and tested with these virtual tools at, at a 4K stereo system that we have set up. And this is what some of the flights look like through these stars. So this is our pre-visualization environment. We developed Virtual Director for Cosmic Voyage back in 97 and patented it, but it's still useful today for doing these camera paths. Uh, through these astronomical objects, and here we get to see the output, what the TV sees, and then we can pull back and see what the camera move looks like. And then this is what it all looks like when it's rendered. And in some cases, we're working with astronomical models, and in some cases, the cosmic web is a, a simulation from Jeremiah Ostreicher in Princeton. We had to do the same thing to build a three-dimensional model from Hubble imagery of our sister planet, Andromeda, and fly past Andromeda and register all of these galaxies from the Brent Tully data set out in space accurately. So these are not stars. One of the big hits of this movie is we live in a big universe, these are billions of star of uh, galaxies out there, each with billions of stars. So giving people this immersive experience of traveling in intergalactic space is part of the goal that we had in the Hubble um, experience with IMAX, which are these screens are 60 feet wide, and in stereo. So we're, you know, we had to animate the location of the camera but then we've got this 3D eye separation. And in some places, we're actually separating your eyes by 50,000 light years to be able to, that's how far apart if you were standing out in space to get the kind of eye separation to have it work properly on the IMAX film screen. Um, and we're heading in this path, we're heading past all these objects to the Virgo cluster. You'll see this in just a second. And in this case, in just this one flight from the Milky Way all the way to the um, cosmic web, we had to animate the separation of the eyes for stereo according to what made it look good with your eyes and testing it in that environment and getting it throughput on film. At the end of that tour, uh, we get to the uh, M87, which is right in the middle of the, the um, 
Virgo cluster, and then we make this transition to a Hubble deep field map, and we worked with Frank Summers. We had to extract. When you just get a two-dimensional flat image when you get these optical images back from Hubble. So to make this a spatial experience, we had to translate each of those galaxies into three spatial domains registered in front of and behind. So extracted, taken into software, all of these galaxies with a camera looking at them. You turn it on its side, and you're looking down this Hubble image with all of these galaxies placed in their accurate positions based on frequencies from the data. And then we take a tour through this and integrate the Hubble deep field into the cosmic web. And this is a computation from Jeremiah Ostreicher and Renway Chin at Princeton on the evolution of the universe and the formation of these filaments. Now, I wanted to give you a taste of the layers that had to be brought together. These are all separate layers, and this is just for the Orion shot. Everything from Orion glare elements, the bow shocks, the horsehead nebula, details in each of the nebula. Here's the veil, the approach, Hipparchos far stars, near stars, the protoplanetary disk by Robert Hurt. This is a typical for any of these layers, you can't render all of these elements in the same scene. They have to be brought in. So you are now going to see the first shot of Hubble, which is we start from our place in, uh, on Earth, and we're looking up at the night sky. And this constellation, the Orion constellation, these three stars in the belt and the sword, these are all registered now in three spatial dimensions, but in IMAX film, you're seeing this in stereo as well. So these, these objects start to come apart, and they're not on the same plane. At the first time I saw this in the cave many years ago, oh my gosh, these belt, the belt is not on the same plane. I went and played it over and over and over again. It was an experience, an immersive experience in stereo because you actually get to perceive things foreground and background, and we're heading toward the Orion Nebula there. Now, Leonardo DiCaprio is narrating, and Warner Brothers wouldn't let me have his voice or the music because they're so fearful of pirating, but he's narrating and describing all of these objects that I just gave you a preview. We just went through the veil, and we're going down into the nebula at this point, this three-dimensional spatial object. And again, these are rendered uh, right eye, left eye. So you do note that in the foreground, and this, uh, this is projector stuff here, this noise, but um, the foreground and background, you can see that spatial depth through stereo. Now, stereo has become, 3D has become a big deal in movies. Uh, People love 3D, but we actually use it for scientific applications. It's really important to us to understand where these stars are. And stereo glasses help us to understand the depth of these objects and that these objects are way in the background. These are the very large trapezium stars, and they are so hot and young that the heat off of these stars has literally blown out the middle of this nebula and form this huge valley. So there's all of these, there's over 250 soundtrack layers in the audio for this with all the sound effects of these propylids and stars and rushing wind going by. And Leonardo is really talking about the repair of the space telescope, the Hubble enables us to get some of these images back that we can now understand and experience and really understand our origins better and answer important scientific problems. There's only so many feet in a reel of IMAX 70 millimeter film, so we had to make this jump cut here because we ran out of film. 
this one continuous shot was so long. And so we make the jump cut to the protoplanetary disk uh, where right now star, a star is forming planets and we understand this through the analysis of the data coming back from Hubble. And we believe that these, that these planets and this star is much like how our own star and planets were formed. Now that was the Orion shot that's in the middle of the film. This is the last shot of the movie and it's quite impressive. Again, we've understood now, we've seen astronauts floating up in space with their food floating in space and we're really, um, at this point, at the end of the movie, Leonardo is impressing upon us the scale of our universe. Um, Oh, here we go, sorry. So right here, this, we're, I'm sorry, I got uh, confused there. This is the last shot of the movie and we're leaving the, the Milky Way and we're heading toward our sister galaxy, Andromeda. And again, these are billions of stars because of the resolution of this screen, you can't see it, but in IMAX, it goes on, we rendered over two billion stars just in the Milky Way alone. We leave the Milky Way and we're heading toward our sister galaxy, Andromeda, which science, computational scientists believe that we are going to collide with Andromeda in a couple of billion years. We are being, through gravity, drawn toward this other galaxy. And we made a three-dimensional spatial model of Andromeda from Hubble data for this project and now we're leaving passing Andromeda and we're heading toward the metropolis as Leonardo calls it, the metropolis of the Virgo cluster. The Virgo, these are galaxies, these are not stars, these are all galaxies lined up in filaments, very dense, they're the nearest cluster to our own Milky Way home galaxy and we're flying toward this uh, center of the Virgo cluster, toward M87. And again, the, to get the stereo right, so it doesn't give you headaches, uh, all of the stereo and the eyeball width had to be animated for this particular shot. The director suggested that we go to another place from here and take the Hubble deep field data, and after we fly past this galaxy, and the huge, the surround sound in these theaters are just amazing. They take, we now are transported to the Hubble Deep Field. Now these are all malformed. See how young these galaxies are? We're looking back in the Hubble Deep Field, back into time, back into space. The light that started from these galaxies started billions of years before our own Earth was even formed. That is an amazing thought. Leonardo says it, he says it much better than me, but still, to think that we're looking out into space at light, at the speed of light, unless it travels faster than we have calculated. These galaxies were formed and wouldn't look like this now and that they were formed billions of years ago. Now there's this transition in which we integrate the Hubble Deep Field inside of the cosmic web. As you can see, and you would see this in stereo with glasses, that all of these little dots, these are all different galaxies and they're, they're starting to accumulate, and many in the foreground, and there are more and more, and there's this slow pullback, and the Hubble is, uh, deep field is integrated with the cosmic web. And this simulation by Jeremiah Ostreicher and his colleague Renway Chen, just, it's more, it gets richer, it gets deeper. And on a 60-foot screen with the spatial resolution that you get with film, you see the tiniest of these galaxies deep and back with stereo. 
And the point being of how big our universe really is. And at the very end, we were working with the director and Leonardo had an effect on the script at that time. It was being written even as we were working on these shots. And Leonardo, who is an environmentalist, said, uh, I really want the movie to end back on Earth. So the end of the script ended that we are looking at billions of galaxies, each with billions of stars. And then there is a cross to dissolve back to our blue planet. But we still have an, we live in a very unique place. Our Earth is unique. It has life. It's special. And it is, um, uh, uh, it's a place to be taken care of. So in closing, I just want to say that those two scenes, <laughs> was a tr they were a tremendous amount of work. Um, but uh, we ended up rendering over tw almost 25% of the movie in stereo, in computer graphics, and all data. Uh, the uh, Hubble 3D is just received from the Giant Screen Awards. This is the Academy Awards of IMAX Films, Best Picture, Best Cinematography, and it's the Best Lifelong Learning Film. And Scott uh, Altman, who's one of the astronauts, is an alum from U of I, Grunfield's from Illinois, and uh, it's being translated into all these languages uh, just in August has, has reached that many people. And here's the team. We look relaxed there, right? It's kind of over with. But there's the team in front of our 4K display and um, where we worked with the director. And so in closing, what I want to say is this idea of Renaissance teams, I've sort of been preaching and proselytizing this for many years. And just in the last couple, the provost has asked uh, that I help to foster some of this collaboration at the intersection of disciplines at the university and to synergize with partners in you know, the humanities as well as art. And uh, we're just developing, I just got a text message that our PhD program has just passed up in uh, Chicago through the Illinois Board of Higher Education for a PhD. And, uh, data visualization as part of this will, will be both in art and culture and thinking about the theoretical and cultural aspects of doing visualization of computational science for outreach. And, um, and in this interdisciplinary collaboration, we're also working with the performing arts as well for various performances at the Cranert Center for the Performing Arts. Um, I really believe this interdisciplinary collaboration is like a collective genius. We need more of it for more problems, socially relevant problems, and expanding our disciplines is really important to think about involving the arts and humanities in the sciences and engineering on real world applications. And when I say the arts, I mean primarily the applied arts like design, but I think we have to leverage some of these new perspectives to get a handle on some of the challenges that we have on our planet today. And with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Surely one. Have I put you to sleep? It's a big universe, but you've got your place in it. Any questions? What I'm uh, really curious about, what is your next challenge beyond what you've already done? Uh, what, what is really uh, sparking your, your, uh, uh, your intuition and, and your genius and, and your uh, interest? I really, uh, I really think that um, information visualization of abstractions beyond the spatial domains that we recognize, uh, I think the next frontier are working with not just the scientists, but the citizen scientists that participate 
and gathering data and working with new ways of visualizing relational databases um, is going to be very important to our future. I think there's a lot of data that doesn't come in the form of cubes that relate to spatial domains and the challenges are coming up with visifors that will take that and make that understand understandable to people. Uh, as you well know, we're in a data deluge and, and um, I, I really believe that f focusing, I would like to get more participatory outside of these museums where we all can contribute. There's also some really global challenges that we have um, going on. Um, and, you know, if laptops are down to $500, I mean, data and visuals, if there's going to be a kind of a democratization of data. I think that that's where things are going and that, that the biggest challenges for me are coming in transferring out of the familiar that we have done that we do well, we do so well, and to move our mental mentality toward these new information visualization challenges. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, the differences, the roles you see of real time. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> could you talk about the roles that you see of real time visualization versus some of the the rendered visualization that, that yeah, we saw in your presentation? Yeah. Well, these two are coming, I, well, I always say these two are converging, but no sooner than you get the faster on your GPU interactive, then you can come up with batch rendered uh, techniques for playback that just look better. Uh, that, so the playback are always gonna look better and you're gonna be able to layer more in than in real time. We use nothing but interactive real-time tools right in all of the pre-visualization process. Uh, all of that is, uh, we have to get the data feedback. There's the staging of the data. IO is always uh, the, with the amount of data and trying to, even when we leverage GPU rendering, that's really, it gets down to the amount of data and the IO getting it into the GPU. So game engines. You know, game engines, uh, I'm sort of writing a history uh, of uh, what took place at NCSA, but back as early as 1990, uh, Jim Clark was looking at Nintendo and data visualization. So game engines and visualization for interactivity. But, but the formatting that and getting huge amounts of data into a game engine, that's the challenge in that interactive, leveraging those kind of interactive. So, you have to have interactivity. We're, we've got this petascale machine. How, it's going to be generating so many numbers. How in the world are you going to store it? We've got so much data that's stored that we never look at. NASA is sitting on so much data. We have, haven't a clue. It's, it's siloed data. Um, so much easier to collect it and archive it than it is to actually deal with it. So um, with a petascale machine generating so much data, with LSST coming online and generating terabytes a day, the question is, is, is really, this is the question, can you afford to not look at something and throw it away? Can you afford throw away graphics? We talked about that a long, long time ago. It's not clear. Because if you take the example of the tornado, they mine that data for a long time. So storing it and looking at it after the fact and going through an interactive exploratory process is an important phase. It's a, an important part of the pipeline. So um, real-time rendering, I just don't believe it's ever going to catch up with batch rendering. You know, the, as soon as you get the computer to go fast enough for real-time, you can make it do other things for, so I think that that's where it's at, but real time is better and the challenge with gaming engines is dealing with the amount of data that we have to deal with. If you got any not, new ideas about the petascale, let us know.
it's, it's really going to be a challenge, all that data coming in. And, you know, we just, what do you, you know, it's amazing. What if we have all this data sitting out there that we've never looked at, and we find out you can go faster than the speed of light? What if some of our assumptions, scientific assumptions, are built upon the things that we haven't taken the time to look at? I've often wondered that. Well, I go faster than the speed of light all the time, so. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time and attention.